So we're going to do two parts to this. So the first part is going to be super introductional. Uh, there's going to be lots of pretty pictures. There's going to be a lot of cool stuff. Uh, it's probably going to be 30 minutes long. Uh, after that, we're going to take a five to seven minute break, let everyone catch their breaths, and then we're going to go into some technical details. We're going to be implementing just a little bit of stuff that we talked about here in the first 30 minutes. So it's totally fine it, during that seven minutes if you're like, hey, I'm not a super technical person. I'm not, I'm not really interested in code. I just want to head out and you know, relax for a little bit. So please, I will not take offense if you leave during that time. However, if you leave during any other time, I will take offense. So, <laughs> okay. Representational learning. I want to give you guys a little bit of context, um, and then we can dive into what representational learning is. Okay, the big picture. Uh, so you guys know about AI. AI is kind of like the big thing. It's this umbrella term for a lot of things that we're doing currently right now. Uh, one of the examples I put up for AI is a knowledge-based system. Uh, one of the definitions I like for AI is making computers do smart things. So if you guys know about binary search, that's kind of smart. Computers are doing it. You could probably classify it as AI. Some of the earliest AI was like, bran or was, uh, like branch and bound for doing tree search. Uh, so AI is super broad. If you go one step into AI, you talk about machine learning. Machine learning is a little bit more sophisticated. It's where the computer takes a little bit more of the processing than the human. The human had to design binary search by hand. Machine learning, you just need to design all of your features by hand, and the computer will take care of the rest. Representational learning and then deep learning are even more sophisticated techniques. So what do I mean? Uh, this is an awesome picture. So the idea here is that representational learning is something that not only learns how to take features and transform them into a prediction, but it learns what features are good in themselves. This is kind of the magic of representational learning. You don't even need to tell it what's important in your data. It will learn that for itself. The magic of deep learning is it stacks representational learning on top of itself. It takes features that were really, really good, and it learns new features on top of those features. And it repeats this process in a multi-layered fashion. This is one way to think about deep learning. There's like five ways to think about deep learning. This is just one of them that happens to be pretty good and gives us a good intro to representational learning. OK, so representational learning is pretty cool. It involves learning, and it's one step away from deep learning. But why should you care? OK, so I've got two quotes. Um, these quotes were, OK, that looks OK. So these quotes were sort of in the beginning of the class. Uh, but I'll just go ahead and sort of read them out loud for you. So just as there are odors uh, that dogs can smell and we cannot, as well as sounds that dogs can hear and we cannot, uh, there are also wavelengths of light that we cannot see and flavors that we cannot taste as human beings. Uh, so why then, given our brains are wired the way they are, does the remark, perhaps there are thoughts we cannot think, surprise you? Right? Uh, representational learning is about thinking those thoughts that we cannot think. Um, there's one more slide here. This is pretty long, so I'll let you guys read this for about five seconds. <laughs> so yes, there are thoughts we cannot think. However, we can build tools in order to think them. Okay? So I'm not going to tell you what these thoughts we cannot think are. I'm going to kind of let you guess as we sort of go throughout this presentation. Right at the end, I'll give you a little summary of what I think the thoughts we cannot think and machine learning helps us to think are. Um, but let's dive in. So, so representational learning is about thinking the unthinkable. I'm going to try to let you think the unthinkable a little bit today. So you should be excited. OK, so the first thing I just want to explain very briefly is, OK, so representational learning is a tool. It helps us. Uh, how does the tool work? I'll give you a very brief introduction. Um, so neural networks are able to create pretty efficient representations. Um, so first, uh, consider this data set. Uh, this data set contains two manifolds, a blue manifold and a red manifold. So this data set is in two dimensions. It's two dimensions. There are red points and there are blue points we're trying to classify, which are red points we're trying to classify, which are blue points. Okay, hard problem. For us, pretty easy. If we go ahead and we feed this into I have no idea how to turn this off. So if we go ahead and we feed this into a neural network, uh, it won't do a good job if it's only one layer. And why? Uh, it's because the neural network hasn't had time to build up the feature representations to help it learn. In fact, you see it just draws a straight line down the middle. And so that gives it some reds that are red, and some reds that are blue, and some blues that are red, and some blues that are blue. That's not good. 
So what do we do? We stack one more layer on top. Now what most people do is they stack the extra layer on top and they look at the output. And they're like, yeah, my neural network works, very exciting, go to the boss. But if you're really clever, you'll actually see what the neural network is doing in the second layer. Uh, this layer is called the hidden layer, which makes sense, it's hidden. Normally you don't see that. You need to do a little bit of extra work to uh, excavate what's happening on this layer. But notice, the neural network has made a representation of our original data. So the red line and the blue line are kind of squashed, right? They're kind of pulled, stretched, squashed together, such that it can separate them with a single stroke, just a single line. That's kind of cool. OK, still not convinced it's useful. Let's go on a little bit further. So for example, um, who's heard of MNIST here? Right? OK, this is, this is a cool data set. Um, if you're trying to work with deep learning, this is going to be like the go-to in order to learn deep learning. Um, MNIST is a data set of handwritten digits collected by the post office. Uh, it basically is like the letter or the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I guess no 10, but a 0. And you're trying to classify, based on the image of the digit, what number it is. So if you see a 0, you'll say it's a 0. If you see a 1, you'll say it's a 1. It's pretty simple. If we go ahead and we take this representation, and the representation that you start off with is uh, 784 pixels, and we go ahead and we pass this into uh, what's called PCA, something that allows us to visualize this into two dimensions, we get something that looks like this. The first thing, input 784. Um, that's messy. It's super intertwined. Uh, each color represents a different digit. The colors are all mixed up. They're all mashed together. However, if we train a neural network in order to learn which digit is which, the neural network will come up with efficient ways to separate these digits in the intermediate features. So if you look right in the middle, that hidden layer, it has the reds really far away from everything else. It has the yellows pretty far away, it has the purples pretty far away. The internal representations of these digits convey lots of information. OK, so we understand how we construct these digits, but we're still unconvinced. Like, well, like knowing that you know, the letter or the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 can kind of be projected into two dimensions like this is interesting, but how does that help me? So um, this is a, another cool little uh, embedding. Um, there's a couple other little artifacts uh, that you need to be uh, watch out for. Um, I'm not going to be getting into those just because we're short on time because we started a little bit late. So I'm going to skip over these two slides. So what are some embeddings that can actually help us? This is the question. Uh, the classic thing that you probably all have heard a little bit of today is something called a word embedding. So what is a word embedding? So word embedding is a word in some language. Uh, it could be English. It could be Chinese. And we take that word and transform it into a vector. That's about it we do. Uh, there's specific ways we transform it into a vector, and I can talk about that a little bit. But the idea is we transform it into a vector so that computers can understand what these words are. That was kind of the original intent. The intent was computers can't read English, but they can read numbers, so let's transform English into numbers and let them read. That's smart. But it happens, and, and the way that we construct this is with skip thoughts. But again, I'm going to have to skip over this, unfortunately, because of time. But it just so happens that these word embeddings have magical properties. Um, so you can't see anything. <laughs> um, but if you're following along, uh, you can definitely tell that uh, on, on the, on the right-hand side, you've got numbers. Uh, and the numbers uh, 1, 2, and 3 are kind of close to each other. And the numbers several are a little farther. And the numbers 10 and 12 and 50 are really far away. Um, and on the other side, we have other words, like executive, traitor. And these types of things are close together, or chief and minister. There's some meaning that these words convey. And if you embed them into some space, into some numeric representation, we can capture this meaning. So we can go pretty far with this. So for example, if I take word embeddings, such as France, I look at the word embedding for France, and I look at the words that are closest to it, I'll notice I've got Austria, Belgium, Germany. That makes sense. If I look at the words that are closest to Xbox, I get Amiga, PlayStation. Greenish, I get all these other colors. Um, so that's kind of cool. Another thing that you can do is these word vectors have different properties that aren't just similarity. You can subtract word vectors and get out something along the lines of gender. Subtract word vectors and get something along the lines of leader. Uh, so for example, if I subtract man from woman, that's roughly equivalent to aunt from uncle. 
Because you're just taking the, the femininity or masculinity difference here. And you're looking, and they're real. This is kind of interesting. So we can take this, and we can look at relationships instead. So for example, France is to Paris as Italy is to Rome. That makes sense. So this is not done by handpicking these things. This is done by looking at the numerical representations of these words that computers build. So small is to larger, as cold is to colder. That makes sense. Something that's kind of funny at the bottom. Japan is to sushi as Germany is to bratwurst. And USA is to pizza, because we invented pizza here. Uh, um, so there's a lot of cool things here. OK, this is fun. This, this perhaps can sort of lead us to understand a little bit about our culture and do some introspection. I don't see how it's useful. Um, uh, in fact, uh, word embeddings tend to be one of the most useful facts about modern natural language processing. Uh, this is the stuff that Google uses in its sequence-to-sequence -sequence models to do Google Translate. Um, so let's look at some examples that might be useful. Um, the general strategy is we take words, we put them into embedding space. We make them into numbers. We then do some functions of those numbers, and useful things pop out. For example, we can take English words and put them into embedding space, and Chinese words and put them into embedding space. And voila. Translation, uh, roughly. Uh, this is, uh, there are better and more effective techniques for translation, but this is kind of cool that this does like an okay job. So the English words and the Chinese words do come close to each other in embedding space, a little bit. But there's even more. We can go ahead and we can take words and images and plop them both into embedding space, and this is super cool. The idea will be, you'll have a dog, the word dog, and you'll have lots of pictures of dog. And all those pictures of dogs will be surrounding that word because they're similar in embedding space. So if you actually look at this data, what you'll see is that ship, automobile, airplane, they're all by pictures of airplane. And they're also pretty far away from things like cat, dog, bird, because these concepts are semantically quite different. So word embeddings, embeddings themselves have lots of uses. Uh, we understand how to construct word embeddings. We understand some of the uses. I'm going to have just a little bit more fun by showing you a couple more word embedding type stuff. I'm going to talk to you about why word embeddings are a way of visualizing the unthinkable. And then I'm going to take a little bit of a break. So let's get to it. So we can use word embeddings for sentences as well. This is kind of cool. In this case, we use a sequence to sequence model. So we feed lots and lots of word embeddings into what's called a recurrent neural network. And we can, uh, sorry. Uh, into a recurrent neural network, and we can get out translation from that. Or you could feed them into a tree representation and try to get what the sentiment of a sentence is. So notice how up here you look at doesn't. We'll reflect negatively on the entire sentence of care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor. So all of those words are kind of positive, except for if you don't care about them. What you can also do is you can take uh, the cat sat on the mat put it into an English word embedding, and spit out French word embeddings using a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. And this is what's currently done in state of the art. Yeah. You can even embed entire sentences. And you'll notice that 21 years old when, was 21 years old, was 15 years old when, are all similar to each other. So I hope you're starting to see that we don't necessarily have to embed just words. We can embed lots of things. Uh, and in fact, near the end of class, we're going to be embedding senators. So US senators, and we're going to be seeing some interesting properties about senators, perhaps their partisanship. So we can go ahead and we can do this for, uh, in this case, unfortunately, you can't see all the gray stuff. We can go ahead and we can do this for Wikipedia articles. We can go ahead and show that cities are close to each other, travel is close to each other. We can see microtopics. For example, we can look at Bollywood as a subgenre of movie types, and we notice that it's in its own little world. We can notice that jazz is its own little world of music types. Right? So we can do lots and lots and lots of clever stuff about this. So I guess before I sort of show you the conclusion slide, um, what do embeddings allow us to do? What do embeddings allow us to visualize that we couldn't naturally do it? I can, I can know what the similarity of words are. I can say that queen is kind of near king. I could plot that myself. <laughs> That's true. That is true. And that, that hits on it. We couldn't do it in every single language known to mankind. 
the thing that it allows us to visualize, in, in my own opinion, and you can, you can have opinions on this, is that there's no possible way that a human can look through all of Wikipedia. No human can read all of Wikipedia. No human can look at all of the data in one single example. Embeddings allow us to visualize the multitude. That's what I think is cool about them. So in conclusion, uh, I think representational learning is really, really cool. I think more people should be using it in order to understand their data sets, in order to understand uh, actually some interesting biases that might occur in society. Um, I'm going to be showing you this right after. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a treat. So there's one more use of embeddings that I think is, is very cool. I don't always show this slide, but it's, it's kind of fun. So who's heard of fan fiction? Yes, OK. So if you go ahead and you take fan fiction, and we do a different type of embedding. In this case, we're going to do a graphical type of embedding. There's lots of ways to embed. We can get some pretty interesting results. For example, this one. Um, yeah. So we've got some dots. They're colored in a specific way. I've got some letters up here. Let's see, HP slash HG. Hmm, yes? Harry Potter fan fiction. <laughs> so HG slash HP is the ending we all wanted. Harry Potter with Hermione Granger. Please, there's no question here. Um, yeah, undisputed, undisputed. There's uh, Hermione Granger with Draco Malfoy in the bottom, which is kind of weird to me, but. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um, and you notice that uh, it's interesting. It shows that people read these fan fictions uh, in a very specific way. They're looking for a very specific topic, right? And they're looking for kind of the relationships that are involved in the fan fiction art. Um, so you can see, obviously, in Spanish, English, French, you get some uh, different clusters. I also, uh, there's some cool stuff for Naruto, for people that have, are interested in that. So you can just check out the slides if you're kind of interested in that. And these are kind of relationships in Naruto as well. Um, and then for anyone that's ever read Twilight out here, which I imagine is none, there's also a small Twilight fan fiction. But there's not a lot of, it's not as interesting. It seems like everyone just likes Bella and Edward. So, OK, hopefully this has gotten you to think quite a lot. Um, uh, again, the link to my slides I provided to you right in the beginning. You can go ahead and grab those. Um, there's a link to Twitter. I really don't tweet at all. I just tweet when I attend these types of events. And YouTube. I, I do some educational content. So people that are interested in doing things like causal inference or uh, statistical inference or sort of a little bit more heavy hitting data science type stuff can check that out. And feel free, you can email me at nate at 3scientist.com.